Calathea, the Goldilocks of the indoor jungle. She's a finicky one. She's a tricky one. She knows what she likes, and she's going to tell you if you're putting her in an environment that she doesn't like. However, she is oh so worth it when it comes to the incredible variety, the colors, the dense foliage that a happy Calathea will show off for you year-round, even in those dark winter months. They are not the easiest plant to have indoors, but it is doable, plant friend. Fear not. By the end of today's video, you will know everything you need to know to have the beautiful, wide variety of Calathea thriving in your home. Welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy. Hello, plant friends. Welcome back to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Maria. I'm your new best plant friend, and I'm here to help you care for plants successfully and grow joy in your life by doing so. And if you're a returning listener, welcome back, my old plant friend. What an honor it is to be alongside you on this planty journey of cultivating our indoor and outdoor jungles. Today's episode is all about the Calathea, or some people call it the Calathea. Maybe some people call it Calathea, whatever, potato, potato. We're calling it Calathea because that's its Latin genus name. It's otherwise known as the prayer plant. But I'm so thankful to our podcast partner today, Proven Winners Leaf Joy, for partnering with me on this Growing Joy with Leaf Joy mini series on the podcast. Once a month, we're doing genus deep dives on care. You might have listened to our Ficus episode last month or our Alocasia episode the month before that. Stay tuned and make sure you're subscribed because every month we're doing deep dives on these genera for you. All right. So. We're going to start this episode off, plant friends, setting expectations. <laughs> I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Calathea are not for everyone. And by the way, I call them Calathea, 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 whatever, but I call them Calathea. They're not for everyone, okay? Now, of course, by the end of this episode, if you want to be someone who cares for Calathea, you will be able to be someone who has a beautiful, happy Calathea in your home. But I say that Calathea aren't for everyone because what I have found after talking to, at this point, thousands of listeners in our community is that sometimes Calathea tend to be what I call a plant fail plant. So someone who might be a little naive, might not know any better, goes to a plant shop and they see these Calathea. They have incredible leaves. You know, they're pink, they're purple, they're green, they're mint green. They have amazing foliage and they're like, oh, this is the one I want to bring it home. But they don't understand that this is kind of a level 2.0 plant. There's some specific care requirements needed for this plant to thrive. And so if you take a Calathea home not knowing what is needed to care for this guy, it's going to die pretty quickly on you. Or it's going to shrivel up and turn pretty brown and not look as beautiful as it did at the garden center. And what I see is a lot of people People just take one Calathea home and they're like, oh, I'm a plant killer. But actually, there's a wide world of plants that you can bring home and have thrive in your space. It's just about picking the right ones. And even in the genus of Calathea, I have multiple Calathea under my care right now. And some are thriving and some aren't thriving. So even within the, the genus of Calathea, there are some easier care plants and some harder to care plants. At the end of the episode, I'm going to go through every Calathea I own in order of easiest to most diva-esque. So fear not. And if you're someone who struggles with picking the right plant for yourself, I have a plant parent personality on my website. It's free. You can just go to growingjoywithmaria.com to take it. And it takes two minutes. It's free to complete. And you'll get a list of, you'll get your plant parent personality and a list of plants perfectly curated for you and your lifestyle. For Calathea, I would say a mindful plant parent is a great match for a Calathea, someone who wants to engage with their plants, someone who wants to keep their eye on humidity, their eye on soil moisture, right? But if you're a low maintenance plant parent, if you're like traveling a lot, (laughs) if you're trying to like only water your plants once every two to three weeks, Calathea probably are not going to be on your list of plants that I would suggest you buying. But you can take the quiz if you're curious. But the mindful plant parent, Calatheas are a fabulous option for you. 
So why does everyone gravitate towards calathea? Because they are so freaking beautiful. I like to say that calathea are like mother nature's art project. When you look at the wide variety, so many of them have these incredible patterns on their leaves, whether it's stripes that are like pinstripes, maybe some of the stripes are white or pink. Some have beautiful outlines. The patterns on the leaves literally sometimes look like watercolors or oil paintings done by Mother Nature, right? They're almost unbelievable. I have looked at Calathea before in disbelief that this is real, that this grows in nature because they're so striking. They're so stunning. This is also a genus where you can find a lot of different color variation, purples, pinks, dark greens, light greens, whites, mint greens, where you can really be really playful with how you incorporate them into your plant collection. Most Calathea also have these gorgeous purple undersides of the leaves, which are absolutely stunning. They could make an amazing statement plant, one plant in the corner, you know, in the center of a table, or you can group them, multiple different types of Calathea together, which looks really stunning. There's such a wide variety of things that you could do with Calathea from a design standpoint but you've got to nail the care. Stay tuned for the end of the episode. I'm going to tell you a really embarrassing story about a Calathea that I was eyeing on Instagram for so long, finally brought it home, basically almost killed it. And I've resuscitated it, but I'm going to share that whole story with you later on in the episode. But first, we need to dive into Calathea care, general care. And whenever I'm looking at a genus, whenever I'm looking at a plant and talking about plant care, I want to first take a minute to talk about how the plant lives and thrives outdoors, right? Where can we find Calathea in nature? And then how do we best replicate that indoors? And as you're going to find in most of these genus deep dives and most conversations I have on this podcast, it's sometimes naive to think that we're going to be able to replicate the forest floor of a, a jungle floor in our dry homes, but we can do our best. We can try, right? So One of the coolest and fun facts about Calathea that I want to share with you is that they are part of the Marantaceae family, which is also known as the prayer plant, prayer plant family. So you might hear Calathea referred to as prayer plants, and that's because their leaves move up and down during the day. So their leaves move up during the day and then down at night, and it looks like they're almost praying, right? So the leaves coming up and down look like hands moving in and out of prayer. And I think that's really sweet. And I think... If you're like me and you like to grow joy in your plant collection, you know, using your calathea in your collection as also a gratitude practice. So if they're the prayer plant, every time you look at a plant, say a kind of prayer of gratitude for someone or something in your life. That's a sweet little practice that I do when I can remember. But enough sappy stuff, Maria, let's dive into the care. So high level overview of calathea. These plants are clumping plants, so they don't grow tall like a philodendron or a ficus that we talked about last month. They're clumping plants, so they're going to clump out. They're going to grow out on the rainforest floor. That's why these plants can be so beautifully dense and robust indoors because they're clumping plants, so you're going to see them fill a pot more and more and more. And they're going to kind of crawl across the rainforest floor. So let's think about the rainforest floor for a minute. The rain forest, right? That soil is probably going to be moist at all times, and it's going to be super humid on the rainforest floor. If you've ever walked through a rainforest or a jungle, you know how kind of oppressively humid sometimes those conditions can be. So with that in mind, let's dive into how to replicate the rainforest floor in our homes, essentially, which obviously I wouldn't quite advise. I feel like the paint on your walls wouldn't be thankful for that. But here's what you need to know about Calathea Care indoors. So first off, if we talk about light, so if, you know, the Calathea are growing on the rainforest floor, they're not at the top of the canopy, right? They're in the understory of the jungle. They're only getting dappled light. These beautiful leaves tend to be a little bit sensitive. They don't want bright, direct light. Don't put them in your southern facing windowsill, which is great because our ficus need our southern facing windowsills and direct light. So Calathea are going to want bright, indirect light. You can put them under a grow light if you want, but they're going to want some diffused light because that's what they're getting in the rainforest. Now, don't just put them in a bathroom with no windows and think that's okay. Calathea still need light. All plants still need light. And that's why I really hesitate to label any type of plant as a low light plant, because then I feel like people put them in no light, essentially. So Put them a few feet from a window and you should probably be fine based on your indoor lighting environment. If you don't understand your indoor lighting environment, no fear. I have a free download on my website, Understanding Natural Light. It's a three-day worksheet that you work through measuring the light in your house with a free app. You can click the links in the show notes or go to the freebies portion of my website. It's a free download. 
Another thing about light that I think is cool now, it's said, it's speculated that most Calathea have purple undersides of their leaves. And the purple undersides of their leaves is apparently an adaptation for low light plants. So that dark purple helps the plant absorb as much light as possible. I think that's super interesting. I also think the purple undersides of Calathea are some of the most glorious parts of them, especially when their leaves are up. That kind of flash of purple amidst a sea of green plants is so beautiful and adds an extra variety and adds an extra texture to your plant collection from your color palette. If your Calathea is more variegated, if you have a Calathea that's pretty much dark green, that's going to need, you know, that bright indirect light, medium light situation. If you have a Calathea that's more variegated, that maybe has more white or more pink, those plants might need a little bit more light because there's less chlorophyll for photosynthesis in them. So general rule of thumb, plants that are colorful, like pink might or variegated, like a white variegated, like a Monstera Thai constellation that's variegated will need more light than its non-variegated sibling. So bright indirect light for Calatheas. I hesitate to say low light. I will say many Calathea are low light tolerant, but I don't like to say any plant is low light, frankly, on this podcast. <laughs> So with watering, this is where we dive into the Goldilocks territory of the Calathea watering and humidity. Watering and humidity tend to be the reasons why people fail with Calathea. So I'm going to go a lot into depth here. So when it comes to water, they're like Goldilocks where they don't want wet feet. They don't want to be sopping wet. Wet feet is a nickname in the hort industry for like sopping wet soil. But they also don't want any form of dry soil. Calathea want a really even moist soil at all times. I have learned this the hard way. I have two Calathea under my care that like the minute their soil dries out a little too much, they just flop over and they get brown and they're they're divas, right? They're water and humidity divas. That's what the Calathea is. So make sure that the soil remains evenly moist. A couple of tips for doing this. Use a high quality organic soil potting mix that is aerated so it doesn't retain too much water, but also like retains enough water, right? Don't put your calatheas like in perlite. I put them in my Espoma organic potting mix. I put everything in. I also have been playing around with um, these terracotta watering spikes. The one that I have is a little ceramic mushroom that's on top of a ceramic watering spike, but you fill the mushroom with water and then the terracotta watering spike slowly releases water into the soil. That's a great option, but I'm finding that I have to remember to refill the watering spike, right? So I found that, you know, once I forgot to reload the watering spike and then the plant dried out. Other people like putting Calathea in self-watering pots. That's a great idea. The self-watering pot, depending on what type you get, it self-waters the soil, right? You have a water reservoir that wicks up the water, keeps the water moist. Once again, you have to make sure that you refill the water in the water reservoir because that water reservoir might dry up at a different rate than the rest of your plant collection in soil. So I have found sometimes self-watering planters don't work for me because all of my other plants are in soil and sometimes I forget. But if you have a lot of calathea, if you have a lot of high maintenance plants, a self-watering planter is a great idea. And there's so many different varieties on the internet and some of them are so beautiful. I was just at a flower show where I was talking to the ceramicist who makes these gorgeous self-watering pots and I wish I bought one. Another thing I've been playing around with with my Calathea is putting a very light layer of moss on top of the soil. So when you water the plant, you water the moss and then the moss stays moist. And I feel like the moss just helps maintain a little bit more moisture in the soil. I'm still in my experimental stages with that. So if you've had any success with that, let me know. But basically high level, you're trying to keep that soil moist, but not wet because you don't want the plant to sit in wet soil because then the roots will rot. So you got that's where you have to be a little bit careful. I would keep these plants in a high trafficked area of your home. So it's easy for you to keep your eye on the soil, right? So put them in your kitchen, in your office, in your living room, places that you're spending a lot of time so that you can easily kind of just do a soil moisture check, you know, once a day, once every couple of days, especially if this is your the beginning. If you've just started caring for Calathea, you're going to have to kind of be in tune with that plant pretty much on a daily basis until you get the flow of how much time it takes for the soil to kind of dry out for you to water again. So I've found putting high maintenance plants like Calathea in high trafficked areas of your home really helps. I have all of mine in my office where I spend all day, right? So I'm looking at all my Calatheas all day long, and now I'm able to really notice when they start going south so I can make sure that they're watered. 
One other note, if you're noticing that your calathea are getting a lot of brown spots, but you're nailing your humidity and you've kind of, after you've listened to this episode, you've done all the other troubleshooting thing, calathea can also be really sensitive to the type of water you water them with. Now, I hate this because I do not like my plants drinking fancier water than I drink and I drink the tap water, but... Calathea can be really sensitive to the hard minerals that are in tap water. So if you're noticing that you're getting like brown or white spots on your calathea, I would try watering with filtered water. So you can water from your Brita, you can buy, you know, spring water like in the gallon jugs and just keep that specifically for your calathea. I know that feels high maintenance, but if you really want to like nail your calathea care, you're probably going to have to look at the type of water you're watering with as well if you're struggling with those brown spots. Fancy ladies, these calathea. I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor and partner of today's episode, Proven Winners Leaf Joy. They have partnered with me on this mini series on the podcast, Growing Joy with Leaf Joy. Each month, we're doing a genus deep dive into how to care for the wild world of houseplants that we all know and love. And Proven Winners Leaf Joy is growing the greatest houseplants out there. I visited their greenhouses this year and I was so blown away by the work that they are doing in this very fancy state-of-the-art European greenhouse, selecting only the best plant genetics and growing them to the best versions of themselves. I mean, the control that they have over growing these plants is so high. And when you're choosing a plant like Calathea, that's a trickier plant to care for, you want to choose a really good plant, right? If you want to care for a harder to care for a plant, you want to make sure that you set yourself up for success by at least choosing a really healthy, well-grown plant and choosing the leaf joy option is a really good idea. I also love that their plant tags have real scientific Latin names on them. I think that means so much and they have care guides for you. They really have their consumer success in mind. So next time you're at your favorite garden center, look for the Proven Winners Leaf Joy plant tag. You will not be disappointed in the variety and the quality. I've been loving the Leaf Joy houseplants that I've brought into my home this year. Find Plant Joy and Leaf Joy. Head to provenwinners.com to find your local Leaf Joy dealer and ask for Leaf Joy at your local garden center. Thank you again, Proven Winners Leaf Joy, for this partnership. <music> Also, because we're always talking about how to grow joy with plant care, you know, since Calathea are a little bit more high maintenance and they are a plant that you're going to have to commit to engaging with once a day or once every couple of days, choose something that you can also engage with yourself in that time. So whenever you're going to like check the Calathea's soil moisture, is there some aspect in your life that you want to check in on? For me, recently, I'm trying to reconnect with friends over the phone. I live in the mountains and I've gotten really secluded and isolated and I haven't been very good at keeping up with my friendships lately. And so when I look at my Calathea, when I water my Calathea, it's also an opportunity for me to be like, have I called any of my friends today or yesterday? Like, do I need to call someone and check in with someone tonight or maybe tomorrow morning? Like, it's a nice way for me to check in on my goals for the year that I have. So just an idea if you want to take your Calathea care practice even deeper than just looking at your at your water, which, you know, I love. I love making everything about my feelings. <laughs> Okay, humidity. Now, this is really where your Calathea are going to thrive or die, right? Not die, but they're not going to be happy. You can have Calathea in a non-humid, in a dry space. If you put your Calathea in a dry space and you water it correctly, your Calathea will stay alive, but they will not look beautiful. If you want the beautiful Calathea that we see on Instagram that are so gorgeous and so lush and so full and none of their leaves have brown spots on them and brown outlines, you will need to add humidity to your Calathea. Calathea are living in the jungle understory. They want humidity, right? The understory of the jungle is probably 80 to 90% humidity, right? And then we're putting them in our homes. I'm looking at my home, my hygrometer, my office is 30% humidity today because I didn't turn my humidifier on. My Calathea does not want that, right? My Calathea is miserable, particularly my Calathea orbifolia. I would say... She's one of my top, most sensitive Calatheas that I've had. And she is an Instagram plant. I coveted her on Instagram. I saved so many pictures of her on Instagram. I've wanted a Calathea orbifolia forever, but I've restrained because I know that they're really hard to care for. I got them because of this partnership with Proven Winners. They sent me a Calathea orbifolia. I'm so excited. But what I realized is, you know, their leaves are so thin and so delicate that 
they really do need humidity. So, you know, after being in my home for a couple of weeks and not having that high greenhouse humidity, the outside, even outsides of all of my Calathea orbifolia leaves have crisped up and turned brown. If you see even browning alongside all the, you know, the outside of the leaves, almost like a crown of brown, that is an indicator that your Calathea or any of your plants is not getting enough humidity. So I run my humidifier when I can, but by the nature of my house and my lifestyle, when I travel and stuff, I don't always have the humidifier as an option. So I took my Calathea orbifolia and I put it under glass. I talked about this in my alocasia episode, but if you struggle with humidity and if you want to provide ample humidity for your houseplants, the best way to do that is to have a, a humidifier. You can put all of your high humidity houseplants in one room and run a humidifier in that one room, right? That's what I do in my office. All my high maintenance plants are in my office. I've got my humidifier. I diffuse my essential oils in it and I live my best life. If a humidifier is not available to you or not your journey, I hear you. The pebble tray with water, I find, is not going to do it for the humidity that your Calathea need. I would not suggest that. I would not suggest misting your plants. Sometimes people say misting the plants to increase humidity. But if you mist a plant and water sits on the leaves, it can actually cause fungal infections. So I wouldn't encourage that either. There's some argument that when you group plants together, you create a microclimate. Their transpiration raises the humidity like in relative area next to them. I do have all of my Calathea grouped in with other plants in hopes that I, you know, get a few <laughs> a few points of humidity there. But what I have found is Calathea love growing under glass because when you grow them under glass, you create a very humid environment. So I have something called a wedding vase. I show it in the Alocasia episode on my YouTube channel. It's a huge glass vase with a top that I bought the day after my wedding. That's why I call it my wedding vase, but it's enormous. And so my Calathea orbifolia, I almost killed it. I went on, I took a work trip and I came back and she was really upset. And so I had to prune a bunch of her leaves off. I put her in my wedding vase. I put the top on. I created this high humidity environment. She's bouncing back and growing all sorts of new leaves. I can't wait to see what the new leaves look like and ideally see if I can avoid that browning. But the browning is definitely from the lack of humidity. Another thing with Calathea that I will say is they are resilient. Calathea are very resilient. So say you crisp them up, right? Like they're not just gonna die. They're, they might drop a few leaves. They might get some brown leaves, but you can just prune those leaves and the Calathea, as long as the roots are okay, the Calathea will grow back for you. Very similar to ferns. You know, they're hard to have thriving, but they are pretty hardy. So don't fear if you have a mistake with a Calathea like I did with my Calathea orbifolia. I'm not tossing that plant out. That root system is still amazing. I'm just cutting off the leaves that shriveled up, watering the plant, giving it some really good drinks, giving it high humidity what it needs, and it's totally growing back for me. So this is a learner plant, right? Don't expect to bring the Calathea home and nail it upon first try, especially if you're in a more beginner houseplant phase. And you're, you know, if you're an advanced houseplant parent, you might be able to do that. There's a little bit of trial and error here. And that's part of the fun, right? I'm having so much fun playing with my Calathea that are so crispy, putting them in the glass phase, trying this moss on the soil trick, trying my terracotta spikes. Like it's been really fun for me to try and master this new genus that isn't coming as intuitively and naturally for me. So I just wanted to say that to encourage you guys, if you have a misstep, it's okay. Life moves on. So yeah, humidity and watering, those are the two main things you really need to hone in for your Calathea. And if you can do those two things, you're going to be really happy, especially because Calathea are lower light tolerant. So in our last episode, we talked about ficus. With ficus, you really do need to blast them with light. And that's a huge part of what's going to make them happy. With Calathea, it's not so much about light, even though it's always about light, but it's really more about humidity dialing in that watering. So with fertilizing, I fertilize when the plant is growing. So when I see the plant put off new growth, I will fertilize. I don't recommend fertilizing in the quote unquote growing season because with houseplants, especially if you grow under grow lights the way I do, my growing season is year round, right? My houseplants that are growing under grow lights aren't experiencing like the seasons that outdoors are experiencing. So I fertilize when I see new growth to help support the plant grow. And then I want to talk about a couple of troubleshooting situations that I hear a lot of people struggle with. So we already talked about the brown edges, right? So if you see unique one-off brown spots on the middle of your plant, that is more likely a fungal infection. If you see irregular brown spots or like one section of a leaf edge that is brown, that might be fungal. But if you see even browning across the entire edge of a leaf, it is likely a humidity issue. 
So you'll need to up your humidity so that the edges of those leaves do not get crispy. Now, I am going to say this. I don't care if I get canceled for saying this, but I'm saying it anyway. You can trim the brown parts of your calathea off, okay? You can trim the brown parts of your calathea leaves off if you get crispy. There, I said it, plant friends. I'm not ashamed. I have definitely taken a scissor to the brown crispy edges of a calathea and just shaved them off, right? Because as long as the plant has the majority of the leaf still green, it can still photosynthesize. It can still grow. It can still create energy and food for the rest of the plant to grow even more beautiful leaves without brown edges, right? So if you see, you know, a little browning situation, just take some clean sterilized shears and trim those suckers off. Don't make yourself feel bad about it. Don't look at the plant and feel like you're a failure. Just trim the edges off. You're fine. It's all going to be okay. We're doing this for fun, right? We're caring for plants for joy, not to feel bad about ourselves. So give it a little prune. No one will know. I won't tell anyone. Even though I just told, you know, this entire network of listeners my secret. If you're seeing white spots or brown spots on your calathea, it could be a water It could be unfiltered water. So if you're seeing that, I would play around with watering with filtered water, giving that soil a big flush and then watering with filtered water and seeing if that resolves that issue. If you have curling leaves, if your calathea leaves curl, that's likely lack of water in the soil. So I have my calathea picturata, which is such a gorgeous plant, but she's such a diva. The minute she's a little underwater, she just flops over. Like she, her leaves totally curl up and she starts to flop, and then I water her, and then she comes alive again. So when leaves curl, it's like the plant's defense to protect itself, like curling inward. So they also curl if they get too much light. So if you see leaf curling, it's probably too much light or too little water. Yellow leaves tend to be too much water. I usually see yellow leaves in my plant collection when I've overwatered the plant. It can sometimes be underwatering as well, but in general, I feel like it's too much water. Droopy leaves tend to be either too much water or too little water, but my calathea will droop when I have not given them enough water. And in general, with the underwatering, you're going to notice your plant is just going to start to look withered. She's going to be sad. But the beautiful thing is they do tell us they're drama queens and they will act it out for us that they're not feeling very well (laughs) before they totally give up. And when you do see that wilting moment, give them a really thorough water so the soil can completely saturate and they can bounce back in the way that they need to. But I will say this Calathea picturata, I left for a week for work last week and I forgot to ask my husband to water my plants. So I was only gone for a week. I was gone for seven days. I came back. My Calathea picturata, which is not under glass, my orbifolia, which I'm growing under glass, was fine. My picturata, I came back such a drama queen. She had like four completely withered leaves, a bunch of leaves that were totally kind of toppled over and curled up. So I took her into the sink. I gave her a big old water. I apologized to her. I spoke kind words to her and I put her back under my grow light and I refilled the little mushroom watering spike that I have with her. And she totally bounced back. It's wild. It's so fun to watch leaves that are completely toppled over and drooping, just like spring back into action. It's very inspiring, actually. We can take some life lessons from that. So she definitely did lose a couple of leaves, but I'm just trusting she'll grow some more. Like I said, calathea are shockingly resilient. So now I want to walk you through, I own four calathea. I want to walk you through all the calatheas in order of easiest care to hardest care in case you are interested in trying some. And I highly suggest you getting the Proven Winners Leaf Joy variety. All of my calathea are the Proven Winners Leaf Joy. And I just think they are so happy and healthy. They arrived in such beautiful condition and I've really learned a lot from them. So in terms of the calathea that has been the lowest maintenance calathea in my collection, she's not wilted once. She's not curled her leaves. Like she's just been kind of hanging out, riding and out with me. She's been very low maintenance is the Calathea insignis. Technically, Calathea was renamed Gopertia insignis, so technically it's Gopertia insignis, but you'll know it as the rattlesnake plant. So the rattlesnake plant has long lance-like leaves, so they're nice long ovals, dark green edges, light green center with this dark green circular pattern on it, and then beautiful purple undersides. It's a more compact plant. It's smaller, so mine is in like a four-inch pot. It's native to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. It's really one of your classic calatheas that you see at a lot of garden centers, which I love because it really is 
way more hardy than a lot of the other Calatheas that I've seen. So if you want to get into Calathea, but you're scared to try something harder, I would highly suggest the rattlesnake plant. Also the pinstripe plant, it's sibling. So it ha- it has pinstripes. That's another great Calathea to try and get started with. You'll also notice like the leaves are actually slightly thicker than the other plants that I'll talk about that are a little bit harder. So that leads me to think that the plant is a little more succulent than some of the other varieties. Okay. So I think the real stunner of the collection, of the entire collection, I think the prettiest Calathea is the Calathea Majestica Diamond Dazzler White Star. So this is a Calathea that also has those long oval leaves. It's taller than the rattlesnake. So if you're looking for a really small, compact Calathea that can fit on a bookshelf or something, I would go rattlesnake. If you're looking for a taller plant that could be more of like a statement plant in the middle of a coffee table or on a nightstand, like something a little bit taller, I would say go for the Diamond Dazzler White Star. It has pinstripes going down the center vein in the leaf, and the pinstripes are white and pink. And on different leaves, some of the pinstripes are white and some of them are pink, and it looks so cool. Also has those purple undersides of the leaves, dark green leaf background. It's so beautiful, and it's only wilted on me once. (laughs) So I'm a low-maintenance plant parent. So Calathea are a huge challenge for me. So only wilting once is a great sign. <laughs> but I will say it's definitely one of the hardier varieties. Once again, leaves are a little bit thicker. So I'm I'm wondering if there's like a correlation here. But I absolutely love this Diamond Dazzler Pins variety. Oh, and it's native to Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Guyana, and Brazil. Also, the fact that it is pink, I hope that you're getting to know me now on this podcast and you know that I'm obsessed with pink plants because I love pink. Pink is a huge part of my brand. So any pink plant is a friend of mine. So the Diamond Dazzler with its pink pinstripes makes me really happy. Okay, the next one that I will say is probably the most dramatic. She's the biggest diva of the whole collection. So I would definitely not suggest trying her unless you have your watering down is the Calathea picturata. Now, she's worth it because she's absolutely stunning. She's super tall. I don't want to say she's tree-like, but what is she? She's like a foot and a half tall. Big, more circular, still oval, but more circular leaves. Dark green outside, mint green inside. So it's very regal. It almost looks like she's wearing this, every leaf has this dark green crown. And then that beautiful mint green interior. And I feel like I'm seeing this mint green in plants is getting more and more popular beautiful purple undersides. But I will say this is the girl, this is the Calathea that the minute she's underwatered, she's going to wilt and you're going to have to resuscitate her. She will bounce back for you. She will be resuscitated, but you really have to have your water dialed in for her. You cannot miss one day watering or she's going to flop over and be a drama queen for you. But oh boy, she is so beautiful. And then last but not least, the Calathea orbifolia, my Instagram favorite, Instagram wish list plant. I'd wanted her forever and we're struggling. We're <laughs> we're not struggling. We're getting to know each other. Her leaves are by far the thinnest and she's by far the most sensitive. So she's now doing so much better once I put her under glass. So even when I take the top of the glass off and she just has glass on the sides, she's so much happier because if you grow under glass, you definitely have to aerate the glass, like take the top off and then put it back on so there's fresh air circulating. She's so beautiful. I mean, I get why everybody wants the Calathea orbifolia. She's got these big circular leaves, almost silvery, shiny variegation. She's just a dream. And when you can grow her out, like when she arrived to my house, (laughs) she was so lush. She was so beautiful. Her leaves were so big. Leaf Joy did a great job growing her. She has shrunk because of the learning curve that I'm experiencing with her, but she is going to grow in even bigger and better and stronger. Her leaves have crisped on the outside and I have taken a scissor to the outside of her leaves just to kind of trim them up and that's fine, but she has new leaves growing. I'm so excited now that I've nailed her humidity. I feel like for her, it's more of a humidity thing and for the picturata, it's more of a water thing. But now that I've nailed her humidity, I feel like her leaves feel much more comfortable and even more are coming in. I see like six or seven leaves coming in and I can't wait. I can't wait to see what they look like. And I will definitely keep her under glass and keep my humidifier rocking and rolling throughout the winter in upstate New York. So those are my Calathea tips. I think I've covered everything, plant friends. I can't believe I've talked to you about Calathea for almost 40 minutes. Let me know if you have any questions. Please go onto Instagram and let me know what Calathea you have, what Calathea you might be inspired to go get. 
Make sure that you try and get the Proven Winners Leaf Joy variety of Calathea at your local garden center. Thank you again to Proven Winners Leaf Joy for partnering on this Growing Joy with Leaf Joy mini series on the podcast. And yeah, I mean, in general with Calathea, I think the funnest part for me about caring for them is they're a plant that I said I would never care for because they just didn't fit my personality. And although they don't necessarily fit the watering schedule of the rest of my plants, it's been really fun to have to double down and get really sensitive and really tune in to this new variety of plant that I'm not as experienced in. I mean, yes, I'm experienced now. I've been growing them for six months, but they're not the my ride or die plant that I have, you know, over and over again in my collection. I've been scared of them. And it's been really empowering to learn how to care for them, to try new experiments, to get creative, to, you know, try the moss, to try the watering spike, to try the glass growing. It's just like, it's kept my inner student alive. And I think it's also reconnected me with that joy for houseplants that I first experienced seven years ago when I started this podcast because it's totally new and fun. And I hope that this episode inspired you and I hope you try Calathea. Let me know, report back. We'll be back in a month with another genus deep dive. Subscribe and stay tuned to figure out which genus it is. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free. It's super fun. It takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're going to get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle, inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your Plant Parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show, monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. 